The Hebrew El Shaddai is the translation, is the Hebrew of the word, the phrase, the Almighty God, which we're studying about tonight. If you'll turn to Genesis 17, that's where we're going to look. And I remember having an elder in Arkansas one time, and a priest there saying, well, we don't need to study about God. Nobody can understand him, so let's just not even bother. Uh, he had a strong faith in God, and I guess he figured if his was strong, your else should be too. Well, you know, the Bible teaches us a lot about God. It reveals a lot about him. And we've said before, you can only know God as he reveals himself to us. So in chapter 17, we want to stop, stop and think tonight, what does it mean when God says of himself, I am almighty God? Well, we notice this is the term that he uses in reference to Abraham when he begins to make promises to him. In chapter 17, it says, when Abram was 99 years old, Jehovah appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, Well, if you met almighty God, you'd probably fall on your face and worship too. That's the kind of honor and respect that we should give to almighty God. Don't take those, that phrase, though, as just something, well, that's just one of the names of God, and it's just another title. Let's be sure we understand what it means. It means God is the all-sufficient source of all of our blessings, and He can supply everything He needs and everything the entirety of His creation needs. Almighty. Able to do everything which He says that He's going to do, and that's important because God makes a number of promises to Abraham that someone less than Almighty God could not keep. And so again, this term is used about 48 different times in the Bible, always translated Almighty in the King James Version. And again, we have the idea that he has absolute power over all, including us. That it means relatively unlimited in power talking about someone other than God. And so that's what we're thinking about. Well, what's the lesson? What's the so what for it? Well, if God is all powerful, the obvious is the lesson is we should obey him. We should submit to him. So anything God tells Abraham to do, he should do. And that's really the faith that we see Abraham experiencing. And so in our personal life, never think that God's problem, that our problems are too big for God. He can't handle it, or that he doesn't know, or he doesn't see, or he doesn't care, because nothing could be further from the truth. So our goal tonight is to show that God is almighty, able to do everything which he says that he has done, does, and will do. And if that phrase doesn't impress you enough, then you've tried putting your name after almighty and see how that sounds. I am Jordan Almighty. Jordan has that sound. Aspirational to me, it'd be terrifying. Wayne Almighty, of course, you had that movie a few years ago. Yeah. Bruce. Bruce Almighty, and this the very phrase itself is almost comical because it's so untrue, it doesn't even begin to come close to any of us. But if this is true of God, if He is God Almighty, which He is, then we ought to trust completely in His Word. And if He says He's going to do something, then we can trust. That he not only will do it, but he's able to do it. Amen. So again, do not worship a God that is too small. Don't limit him because you can't comprehend something the Bible says about him. Well, again, here's the phrase used in reference to Abraham. He tells him, I am almighty God. And this is not God's first revelation to Abraham, is it? But it is the one that he gives here at this particular time. And Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17 shows us how God spoke through Jeremiah. Jeremiah, he said to God, Jeremiah said to God, All oh Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. And again in verse 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And the answer is no. That's the God of the Bible. 
And of Jesus Christ, he takes this title for himself, which means he's equal to the Father. He's everything the Father is. And that's what the New Testament teaches about him. John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So everything the Father is, Jesus is. And Hebrews 1 says, He's the express image of the Father. Every attribute that God the Father has, Jesus the Son has. So it's not a stretch when Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega. How do we usually take that? The beginning and the end. I'm the start and I'm the finish. I'm the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So that's an important title and name for God, and it inspires us to have a tremendous faith in God and a trust in Him. As we pointed out this morning, the more we believe in the God of the Bible, the way He's revealed Himself, the more we're all inspired by that, the more likely we are to pray to Him and pour our soul's needs out to Him. So he's God Almighty in creation. A God who's powerful enough to create the entire universe from nothing is a God to be feared. How many of you could make the universe if we gave the material? Nobody. Try making the universe without anything. Ex nihilo. We can't do that either. But God can and did, and therefore we should fear him. And that's what he tried to remind us through Paul Romans 1 and verse 20. When we look at the made world, the known universe, it declares his unlimited power and Godhead. You know, I studied the lesson. I'm going to bring preach again here pretty soon because everybody forgot a macro God. And I did some research on the internet. I'm looking up the universe. How large is the universe? How big is it? All that sort of thing. And it's interesting that these scientists who act like they know everything, when they start describing the universe, they say, well, its known expanse is. And it is, it's known this is such and such. But we don't know everything about the universe. I thought, well, thank you. <laughs> Finally admitted you didn't know it all. Well, they can't know it all because it's too big for them. But it's not too big for God because he holds all of it in his hand. So that's how big God is. We need to appreciate that. So again, it's a witness to his eternal power and Godhead so that man is without excuse. We see tremendous design in the universe. Therefore, there must be a designer. So do you believe that God made you and put you here? And therefore, you're responsible to him? The answer should be yes. He's God Almighty in Israel's salvation. And God revealed that to them. And he also expected them to believe. Look at Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16. Because as God reveals himself to Pharaoh and also to Israel, notice how he describes himself. Beginning at verse 13 of Exodus 9, Jehovah said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. You see, it's almost as though God is challenging Pharaoh. They have all their Egyptian gods and they believe in a vast multitude of gods. So Jehovah comes to him and says, okay, Pharaoh, we're going to have a contest except it's going to be no contest at all. If you don't let my people go, then I'm going to bring all of the plagues upon you and your servants and your people, and you'll know there's no God like me. And that's exactly what he did, but Pharaoh didn't believe it, did he? But that's why God did it the way he did it. He wanted that to be a revelation to Egypt. He wanted the world to know the kind of power that he has, how almighty he really is. Because he goes on to say in verse 15, Now if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. He says, you know, I could have just killed you in one swift moment. It's like that. You wouldn't be here anymore. But indeed, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. 
as yet you exalt yourself against my people, in that you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause very heavy hail to rain down, such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. And so he says, you need to be aware. Here it goes. Here's the battle. And he learned the hard way, the kind of God that Jehovah, or God Almighty, is. And then he demonstrated by what he did. Now we need to appreciate that. Well, not only that, that's how Israel was let go eventually by all the plagues, you know that. By the parting of the Red Sea, by leading them into the wilderness, by taking care of them, by feeding them with water and manna, and later on quail, and leading them into the promised land. But then Israel, the nation that was born by God Almighty, soon forgot their God. And now they become so wicked and so evil that God has to punish them by sending them off in Babylonian captivity. Well, with that in mind, in Jeremiah 32, beginning of verse 27, God says this to Jeremiah, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. So what God is telling Israel or Judah through Jeremiah is, the Babylonians are going to carry you off to captivity, but I'm the one that makes them do it. I'm the hand behind it. Don't think that they just decide on their own, well, we're going to, we're going to go in and invade Israel. If God didn't allow them to invade Israel, they never would have been able to. And then in verse 42, he says, For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great calamity on this people, so I will bring on them all the good that I promised them. And fields will be bought in this land of which you say it is desolate, without man or beast, it has been given in the hand of the Chaldeans. Men will buy fields for money, sign deeds and seal them, and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowland, in the cities of the south. For I will cause their captives to return, says Jehovah. So what kind of a God are we talking about? A God that carries Israel away to captivity because of their wickedness, leaves them there for 70 years. And now Judah has become so desolate, people think, well, it's never going to be inhabited again. It's just a wasteland. But God says, no, when time comes, I bless my people again. I'll bring them out of captivity. And they'll go back to that land that people thought could never be inhabited again. And it will be just like it was before. Again, that's an amazing thing. And so this is the God of Israel's salvation. And that's what he told them. And yet so few of them believed or saw any personal application. And the application was whatever God has commanded us in the law of Moses, that's what we need to do. Well, further, furthermore, he is God Almighty over the wicked. In Psalm 76 and verse 10, God said, Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. With the remainder of wrath you shall gird yourself. How does the wrath of man praise God? It praises God when God shows himself to be a righteous God and an almighty God when he punishes their wickedness. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And God tolerates it for a longer period of time than you and I might. But in tolerating it, he's not forgetting it. As he allows that cup of wrath to continue to fill up by the iniquities of a nation or a people. Once that cup is full, that symbolizes God's wrath is now about to be poured out upon that nation. When he pours that cup of wrath back upon their heads, then they get their just desert. And so he punishes the wicked. Again, we remember Daniel chapter 4 when Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was too big for God. And God had that warned him ahead of time. You're going to one day become so powerful that you're going to think, look at all the good that I've done. But don't you be tempted to do that. Of course, that's exactly what he did. He stood out one day on his porch and said, oh, this mighty nation that I have built with my hand by my might and my power. And about that time, the God of heaven said this to him. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. 
And Nebuchadnezzar learned that lesson the hard way. When he finally got his senses back and quit acting like an animal, then he said, there is no other God but the God of Israel, the God of heaven, and I will now bow myself to him. That's something we need to think about as we look at world affairs today. Somebody says, well, I'm going to see what's going on. Well, I can tell you exactly what's going on. Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation is now called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that means when Jesus Christ wants a nation to rise, it will rise. When Jesus Christ wants a nation to fall, it will fall. And we might not be able to see from a human standpoint how that can happen. But look how easily and how quickly God defeated the mighty Nebuchadnezzar. All he did was he said, I'm going to flip a switch and all of a sudden you're not going to be able to think normally. You're going to act like an animal so that you'll know that I'm God. Do you think the God of heaven today decides if I want to bring a nation down? All he has to do is just plant the seed of doubt in a man's and a leader's head. Or cause him to think something that's absolutely improper and incorrect. And in doing that, he can cause them to make terrible decisions that will bring a nation down. It's that easy for God to do. He doesn't always do it that way, but he could. And that's something we need to stop and realize. And when you stop and understand that the things that are going on, God doesn't approve of wickedness. But he has in the past punished wicked nations with another wicked nation. And then punishes that wicked nation with another one. And so he uses nations to pit him, themselves one against the other. But in the background, God is punishing these nations for their wickedness. And that's why they're suffering the way that they are. And so we have to remember as we sometimes sing, this is our Father's God's not letting everything go loose. He's behind everything. And so he punished the wicked, and we need to appreciate that fact. For us today, God is almighty in the gospel. And let's see how he demonstrated that. Well, the first thing he did was cause Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be born of a virgin. And somebody says, that's impossible. Not for the God who created out of everything out of nothing. So if you don't believe Genesis 1-1, you can't get past Luke chapter 1. But if you believe Genesis 1-1, this is easy. This is child's play. But as the angel revealed God's will to Mary in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. How did God do that? By His almighty power. Mary, when she submitted to that will of God, look what she said in verse 49. For he who is what? Mighty. Mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Mary said, be, let it be to me according to your will. If that's what you want, I'll be the submissive servant, and I'll change my life forever, and I'll have the Son of God as my firstborn child. How many of you ladies would like to have that challenge? You talk about pressure. But Mary feels very submissive and if that's God's will, I'll do it. And she wasn't full of herself. She didn't think it was all up to her. It's almost as though she were a passive, obedient servant saying, well, God, I'll let you do that. Let's see what else happens next. And that's in large measure what happened. But you see that God demonstrated his power by making this miracle happen. And his saving word is also powerful. Let's look at Luke chapter, or, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And once you stop and think about this, this chapter just enamors me all the time. From day to day, I think about this. Because in verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Now, how does that demonstrate God's almighty power? Well, let's put ourselves in his shoes. God says, I want to formulate a message that will cause the wise and arrogant to dismiss it as foolish. And I don't want to save them because they're too proud and arrogant and full of themselves. But at the same time, I want that same message to appeal to the humble and the lowly and be the power of salvation to them. Now, if that were a school assignment, how would you go home and begin to formulate that? Especially if you've never seen the gospel and you've never read the Bible. And you've got to do it on your own human wisdom and might. 
Check all the world religions that are nothing more than the formulation of human thinking. And there's some pretty wise statements out there. But nothing like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing even compares. And so as he goes on, he prophesied it before it ever happened. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. We see that in our society today. Let's just compare. Okay, the Bible says God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to save the sin men from the sins of the world. And everybody's invited. Be saved by the gospel. Hear, believe, and think, confess, be baptized. It's pretty simple. Not hard, not complicated. It doesn't take a PhD in science. But on the other hand, if you reject that, what do you have left? Well, we're going to believe there is no God, so everything came from eternal matter. That's what we're taught by our highest men of, of science, right? Except matter is not eternal. The first and second laws of thermodynamics say that matter is not eternal. So they've already violated the law. Their own law of science, not the Bible. They're illogical from the start. Okay, let's look again. And we're going to say that man was created from nothing. And so here we have non-living matter that somehow evolves into living matter. And again, is there any evidence of that scientifically? Not a shred. They've been looking for it all my lifetime and long before that. Not a shred of evidence. There's never been something that's non-existing coming into human or any kind of living form. So they strike two. Well, then they mock us for believing, oh, you superstitious Christians, you think that somebody rose from the dead. Well, Jesus rose from the dead after he was crucified, right? But they want to tell us that something came to life that never was ever alive, which is more superstitious. Especially when there's no proof that something that never lived now is living. So strike three, you're out. You see how the Bible says, I will bring to nothing the wisdom of the wise. And Romans 1 tells the same thing. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And you'll never see them in the universities. They fight tooth and toenail to keep us from having debates religiously on university campuses because it's no contest. Don Patton, who has a PhD in geology, uh, several years ago was invited to speak by the student council, not by the university, but by the student council at a student council meeting on the campus of Texas a and University. And he did such a magnificent job, the professors came and tried to disprove what he was saying, and he just destroyed all of them by the wisdom of the Bible. And they were so angry and so upset, and they've never been in, he's never been invited back. But when you compare the wisdom of God in the Bible to the wisdom of man, it's no contest. We shouldn't be surprised. That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, the dynamo, the dynamite of God unto salvation. It can blow a man apart. And God's word will destroy the wicked and it will exalt the righteous. It will magnify the humble and it will destroy those who are proud and arrogant. Now try forming a message like that yourself and see how easy that is. It's not easy. And the present reign of Jesus Christ magnifies God's power. As we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 21 through 26 again we see the power of Almighty God because it says for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Every saint who has died in Jesus Christ is described as being asleep in Jesus. And that's because the almighty power of God will be known when the resurrection day comes and all the righteous will come forth out of their graves and will meet Jesus Christ in the air and go to heaven and be with him in heaven forever. That's far beyond any human understanding. 
We can't comprehend it. We say, well, the body has returned to dust as it was, so how do you formulate all those molecules and make a human being again? God knows how to do exactly what he needs to do. Besides, we're not made out of a limited number of molecules, are we? Our own body changes and regenerates from day to day. So, but God will take our body and make it alive again, transform into an immortal body. Our Holy Spirit will be reunited with that, and we'll go meet God for judgment for eternity. We can't even describe it very well because God hasn't told us exactly how that works. But I know that it does because someone says, well, how do you know there's going to be a resurrection and all that's going to happen? Because Jesus already did it. He's the first fruits. And that's an Old Testament terminology that says if the first fruits have been offered, the second fruits will follow. So the question is, is Jesus raised from the dead and never to die again? The answer is yes, his body was never found. The enemies tried to find him. They blamed uh, the disciples of Jesus. said, well, they've stolen the body, but they never could find it. The disciples were surprised. And so Jesus was raised from the dead, sent to heaven, never to die again, was preached on the day of Pentecost, 50 days later as being the resurrected Christ. And again, the enemies tried to stop it, but they couldn't. That message spread across the entire Roman Empire, and thousands, if not millions, of people obeyed the gospel of Christians. Here we are 2,000 years later and the message is still being preached. It's still being denied by the masses but the power cannot be denied. So I know that when I die one day I'll be raised from the dead never to die again. Nothing more beautiful than to be asleep in Jesus because we die in hope. Hope of the same resurrection that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. <clears throat> then it says he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he's put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to Jesus, or to God, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And so at the end of the chapter, he says, I declare to you a mystery. And that's going to be a mystery until the resurrection day. And God gives us strength for our faith and our life if we will simply tap into it. We talked about prayer and how powerful that is this morning. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and look at the spiritual battles going on in our minds for our soul salvation. Satan tries to put thoughts and ideas and negativity in our mind to keep us from being saved and going to heaven, causing us to doubt the world rejects God on a wholesale basis, and that's a temptation. Well, I'd like to be like the rest of the world. If I could just be like everybody else, I'd fit in. So there's a lot of spiritual battles going on right between our ears. So how do you arm yourself with that mental battle right here in Ephesians 6.10? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's a battle going on in the minds of men, in the minds of God, in the minds of angels. So put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand when you lay and having done all to stand. Verse 14. All right, how do you get ready for a spiritual battle? You gird your waist with truth. Pilate says, what is truth? Jesus said, I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth, the life. So, number one, believe in the truth. Find out the facts. What is right according to the New Testament? That's the truth. And once you have that, gird your waist, which means strengthen your back. Have the mental resolve that says, when I face the battle of anyone and anything, including Satan, I'll be prepared because I have the truth. <laughs> Number two, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, you can't be living like the devil and think the devil won't call you on it. He'll say, oh, you're a Christian, but you live just like I do, so how are you better? Boy, that's a dark right in the heart. And you'll die spiritually because there's nothing worse than guilt to say, yeah, you're right. I'm not any better than anybody else. I act just like everybody else in the world, so I must quit because there's no use. Well, how do you defend against that? You put on a breastplate of righteousness. You do your very best to do what is right. And since all of us are finite, sinful people, when we sin, 
Rather than give in the devil and say, well, you win, we pray to God, ask for forgiveness, and the blood of Christ will wash that sin away so we've got our breastplate back intact. And you keep it that way. You do everything you can to the best of your ability because you already know the truth. Now it's a matter of doing the truth since you'll be a righteous person. And when we fall short, when there's a hole in the breastplate, you can heal it with the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, doing that, no dart of the enemy can ever get in. Every accusation that may be made against you knows a lie. Just like the accusation that made against Jesus. None of them hurt him because he knew that they were all lies. Lies don't hurt you. Names don't hurt you. What really hurts is when you've done wrong and someone convicts you of the sin you committed and now you know you're done for. So keep that righteous breastplate going. Then shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Everywhere you go, be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Try to be at peace with man and God. Romans 12, 18, as much as is possible, live peaceably with all men. Christians will suffer enough in this life fighting for the truth. Don't make your personality or your disposition such that people will naturally want to fight with you. Above all, take the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Again, what, is, what do you use for a shield? Well, you see the darts and the arrows coming, you throw your shield up. Shield of what? Faith. Your heart that is full of faith. You know, Romans 1.17 says, In the Gospels revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith. You know what that means? From the objective book of faith into your subjective mind of faith. The Gospel is a powerful message, but it only works if you transfer it into your own mind. And so that's, once you do that, that faith is strong. Then there's no argument that man can put against it to destroy your faith because it's based on truth. You're living it righteously, and now you're defending the truth against all the errors that men may throw at you. What a battle. And then take the helmet of salvation. It's called a helmet of salvation because as long as your mind knows you have the hope of eternal life, Nobody can throw you away. Nobody can turn you aside. The devil will do everything he can to get in your head and say, you're not saved, you can't go to heaven, it's impossible, why don't you give up and quit? And the helmet of faith, the helmet of salvation, based on faith and truth, tells you, no, I can go to heaven, not because I'm perfect, but because Jesus Christ saved me. Not because I earned it, but because the grace of God has given it to me. It's a gift, and I'm simply meeting the conditions of salvation to be able to have that. And that great comfort is like a helmet to your head. And then the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's a flaming sword which turns every which way, and it's even better than uh, the dagger of Star Wars characters. You know, well, this is nothing compared to the sword of Jesus Christ. You use the Word of God and defeat all the enemies with it, and they can't battle because they're not fighting you. They're fighting the truth. They're fighting God. And they're going to lose that battle every time, aren't they? Amen. And then as we pointed out this morning, having put on all that armor and doing all the things you should, then pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for your loved ones. Pray for your brethren. Pray for the church. Pray for the city, the state, the nation, the country. Pray for everybody because that's a power that is above and beyond the battle that we're facing. And all of that illustrates how powerful Almighty as we've already pointed out, the resurrection of Jesus Christ in one day of us. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that will one day raise us up from the dead. And God Almighty in judgment. God said to Moses in Exodus 34, He keeps mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and by no means clearing the guilty. God doesn't forget a sin that has been unrepented of. If it had been committed a thousand years ago, he doesn't forget it. So he will by no means clear the guilty. So be sure you're not guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, the children's children of the third and fourth generation. You see, the way we live our lives affects those who follow after us. It can be for good or for ill. It depends on us. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And then he said, if I have now found what? Grace in your sight, O Lord, let me, Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are 
stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. God did so because he's a God of grace. And we need to appreciate that. Nahum said, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Romans 2 says, He will render each one according to his deeds in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So just because God hasn't executed judgment against you yet, don't think he won't. Don't think because you did something wrong five years ago or ten years ago or fifty years ago that you've forgotten about it, so surely God has too. That's not the case. The passage that we just read in Exodus says God does by no means clear the guilty. So how am I going to be sure of my salvation? How am I going to have that helm of salvation? You come and accept the grace of Jesus Christ that will wash away all your past sins away in the waters of baptism as a penitent believer. It's that simple. And so now if you're ready to do that and you haven't, then this is your invitation. And if as a child of God you've sinned and you need to come back to Jesus Christ, that's exactly what you do. If that breastplate of righteousness has a hole in it, then repent of that sin that caused that hole. Confess that sin and say, Lord, heal it. And the blood of Christ will wash you clean again. You'll be as a newborn baby. And your breastplate of righteousness will be intact. That way Satan can't get in anymore. If you need to respond, won't you do it tonight while we stand in the